Here is my life. I give it all to you. Here is my heart, Lord. I lay it before you. Oh, where else would I go?
A God and our Father, once again, we're just so humbly thankful that you allowed us this time and this space to gather here this morning to sing praises and worship thee in spirit and in truth. We pray that everything said and done will be pleasing according to thy will. Heavenly Father, we ask a special prayer for those that are traveling uh, here to worship service. Heavenly Father, we ask you would protect them and grant them traveling graces. Heavenly Father, again, be with us as we continue through this service. These things we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Let us all say, Amen. I woke up this morning with my
Look at him number six one three. I believe that's what it is. Yeah, six one three. So we're seeing. with swift transition no the only plan who can stand be your hopes on things eternal hope to God's unchanging hand now will you hold hold on God's son, changing hand, everybody ought to hold. Just hold on to God's son, changing hand. Will you build your hopes on things eternal? Well, now, changing hand. Now trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring. Now if my earthly friend forsaken, 
and will now still more closely to him cling. Now will you hold and just hold on to God's son changing hand. Everybody all the hold to his hand. Oh, God's son changing hand will now be your hope something the turn hold to God's unchanging hand. Now when your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, now fair and bright the home in glory in your in rapture so will view we all to hold just hold on to God's sun changing hand we all to hold Oh, hold on to God's sun changing high. Will now be your hopes on things eternal. Hope to God's sun changing hand. Eternal God, our Father the creator of all mankind and everything that is on earth. We are pushed out on this morning, dear Father, thanking you for watching over us all night long, giving us the ability once again to come out to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Dear Father, we want to thank you for thy son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on a true to record cross, giving us the right to eternal life. Dear Father, I come to you in behalf of the sick and shut in, not just here at the Northside congregation, but all over the world. Continue to be with them and watch over them and strengthen them, dear Father. Then you know their need better than anyone else does, so bless them and grant them according to their needs. Father, I come Thanking you for all the blessings that I have seen fit to be, this, bestow upon us. Continue to bless this congregation. Strengthen us in the area which is needed as well. Be with John Mc, Brother Mayberry as he come forward this morning to preach our word. Grant him the wisdom and understanding of the thing that he has studied, the thing on his mind. That he might do so in a way that will be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, I do pray these blessings. Amen.
Amen again. Certainly it is a blessing and a privilege from the almighty God of heaven that again we find ourselves on this side of the timeline of life. That for whatever reason he chose to do it, God has blessed us. He has showered us tremendously with his love and his grace and his mercy. And if you ever want evidence of that fact, just consider that for at least one more day, one more moment, you are among the land of the living and you are being seen and not being viewed. To those who may be visiting with us this morning, whether you're in our physical location or in our digital worship space today, we extend to you a warm welcome. We're so glad that you've come to be with us this morning here at Northside, and we do consider you as our honored guest. And it's our prayer today that your visit with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying, and that you will want to come back and be with us just because you have benefited by being here today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities at Northside and wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you can. This morning I'm going to ask that you will join me in the 14th chapter of the gospel account as recorded by Mark. Mark 14. And meet me at verse... 41, and we'll read through verse 43. Mark, the 14th chapter, beginning at verse 41 and reading through verse 43, Mark records this incident. And he cometh the third time and saith to them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately, while he yet spake, Cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. On December 8, 1941, the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, said the following words in a joint address to a joint session in Congress. He said, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. This speech was made on the heels of a surprise attack by Japanese forces on the United States Naval Base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. This attack by Japan and the speech by President Roosevelt were two of the catalysts that forced America into World War II. And while President Roosevelt announced that that would be a date that would live in infamy, there have been many other infamous days in human history. Now, now that word infamous simply means to have a bad reputation. And if you're a student of history, you know some of the more infamous dates 
in our nation's history. Let me just give you a few. October 29th, 1929, the stock market crashed and led to the Great Depression. November 22nd, 1963, the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. April 4th, 1968, the assassination of Martin Luther King in Memphis, Tennessee. September 11th, 2001, which was the day that radical terrorists declared war on the U.S. by flying occupied passenger jets into public landmarks. And I dare to say even January 6th, 2021, the day that a few nutcases upset that their candidate lost in an election stormed the Capitol building in D.C., making death threats and killing and injuring law enforcement officers and destroying property. These dates, along with many others, are printed on the American psyche. And yet, this morning, the text that we just looked at tells us about a night that will live in infamy. It tells us about the events of one night that took place about 2,000 years ago. The night that Jesus was arrested just prior to his trial and his crucifixion was a night that will live in infamy. And it was a night worse than all of those other days that I just mentioned. Why? Because it was filled with such treachery and brutality and hatred that it stands out as one of the most infamous times in history. And I believe this morning that the events of that infamous night have something to teach us 2,000 years later. They have something to say not only about our Savior, but they have something to say about our human condition. And I want to take these verses and deal with the events that took place that night some 2,000 years ago. I want to simply deal with the subject of a night that will live in infamy. First of all, it was a night of conspiracy. See, when Jesus, back up in verses 35 and 36, finishes praying to his father, he announces that the time of his betrayal has arrived. And even while he was saying those words to his disciples in verse 22, we find beginning at verse 33 that Judas appears with a large group of soldiers. And they're there to take Jesus into custody and they were led there by this traitor named Judas. Let's take a, just a couple of moments this morning to walk through a few verses and, and consider some truths that we find here. We're told that the leader of this group, now say that loosely, group, is Judas. Now, now those who may not know, Judas was a man who had walked with Jesus for over three years in intimate fellowship. He's a man who has heard the gospel of grace preached over and over and over again. 
And in spite of all of that, Judas has rejected that gospel just as he has rejected the Lord. Now, if you like your Bible and study it a little bit, it will become clear to you that Judas was simply following Jesus for two reasons. Money and prominence. Bible tells us over in John's gospel account, John 12 and verse 6, that Judas was stealing from the money bag. And number two, Judas probably believed, at least at first, that Jesus, just like the other Jews believed, that he was going to come in and overthrow the Roman government and establish a new kingdom in Israel. And he probably followed Jesus, hoping to get in on the ground level of the action. And when it becomes clear that Jesus would not establish an earthly kingdom and make his followers prominent and wealthy, he goes out and makes a deal with the enemies of the Lord. He goes to the Jewish religious leaders and sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. In essence, he conspired with the Lord's enemies to betray him. And since Judas knew where Jesus would typically spend his time, he leads them to where Jesus was. But not only that, it was apparent that these Jewish leaders believed that Jesus would put up a fight. When you look at John's account of this uh, uh, incident, in fact, let's go there, John chapter 18. And meet me at verse number 3. John chapter 18, verse number 3. The Bible says this, and Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Get this now. John tells us that Judas comes having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. Now, now, I've known you've seen those pictures painted in those movie scenes about the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas comes in and he's leading a group of folk and there might be about 10 to 15 to 20 soldiers with him. That ain't it. A band of men comes from the Greek word sphera. And the sphera was a Roman cohort that was typically made up of, get this, 600 soldiers. 600 soldiers were sent to arrest Jesus. But not only 600 soldiers, John goes on to tell us that there were officers from the chief priests and Pharisees with these 600 soldiers. The officers would just be like what we would call them today. They were policemen, basically. So they send out the police, and they send out 600 soldiers to arrest Jesus, and John lets us know that they were armed to the teeth. So Judas here is not alone in this conspiracy. He's got some accomplices with him. He's got, he's got these uh, uh, Jewish leaders, and he's also got the Roman government. And when they get to Gethsemane, Jesus goes out to meet them. He asks them who 
they're looking for. Look at John's account again, verses 4 and 5. Jesus approaches them and says, who y'all looking for? Who do you seek? They tell him, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus just simply says, that's me. And even though Jesus tells all of these 600 plus men who he is, Judas still comes and kisses him on the cheek. And that's important to get there. Because in that culture, Kissing was a sign of affection and respect. This kind of kiss was a special form of homage and honor. And typically, what would happen is a person who wanted to, to, to give somebody some honor would kiss them on the feet, the back of the hand, or the hem of their garment. Judas chose to kiss him on the cheek. And that was a type of a kiss that showed the deepest type of affection and love. And it was reserved for those people you had a close, intimate relationship with. Get the picture here. By my kiss, I'm showing you that I'm supposed to love and, 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 and all of this to you. But I've betrayed you at the same time. I came with hundreds of soldiers to arrest you. But I love you. I just want to ask the question is, well, what's love got to do with it? Because if this is what love is, I don't want no parts of it. Judas is kissing the Lord. And I say is kissing because that verb there, when it says kissed him, is a verb that shows repetitive action. He keeps on kissing him. It's a series of kisses. And then when he does this, the guards come and take him captive. And John lets us know that Judas offers no, Jesus offers no resistance at all. Y'all know why? Go back over to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 says this, he was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And I just want to tell somebody this morning this. That what Judas does this night serves as a warning of the dangers of of what we call hypocrisy. Judas was as close to Jesus as any man who ever lived. He had heard the gospel straight from the lips of the author and the finisher of our faith himself. He had witnessed love and grace from the one who is love himself. He saw God's power like only a handful of other folks who had seen it. He heard the truth from the truth. And he even acknowledged the truth. Yet, Judas died and went to hell because he failed to believe the truth. Judas literally kissed the gates of heaven and died and went to hell. Question that begs to be asked is this this morning. Can it happen to you and I? Yes, it can. Listen to the words of Jesus himself as he talks over in John chapter 8 and verse 24. 
I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And you have to ask yourself the question, each one of us does. When you reach the end of your life, all of the years of your existence could be condensed down to one question. What did you do with Jesus? Nothing else will matter. Nothing else will be important. Nothing else will be on the table. Nothing else will be considered. Jesus and your relationship with him will determine whether you live forever in heaven or suffer eternal damnation in hell. That night was a night of conspiracy. But it was also a night of courage. You know, as I read these verses, one of the things that stand out to me is the courage of the Lord. John 18 and 4 tells us he goes out to meet the soldiers where they were. He knew why they were there. And he does something that we probably wouldn't do. You know, if, if somebody was coming to arrest us and we knew we hadn't done anything, we'd probably run. We'd probably be hiding somewhere. Well, I, I, I know they probably think I'm going to be at the Garden of Gethsemane, so I'm going to be somewhere else that night. I'm going to get as far away from Jerusalem as I can. They're going to spend the rest of their lives trying to find me. But not only does he meet them, he confronts them about why they're there. When they tell him why they're there, he identifies himself as the one they're looking for. And when he identifies himself and they get ready to arrest him, he doesn't even resist when they try to take him. And if you look back at Mark's account, uh, chapter 14, verses 48 and 49, he even confronts them about their mission and he challenges them. He challenges their courage. Now keep in mind, he's one man. They're over 600. And he says, y'all could have got me if y'all really wanted me any other day. I've been in the temple and everywhere else. Y'all knew where I was. You wasn't bad enough to get me? Jesus ain't no shrinking violet. He's not the soft brother we see in them pictures all the time. Jesus stood up to folk, and he stood up for what he believed in. And he did that in the face of knowing everything that was about to happen. He knew what lied ahead. He knew that his men would forsake him. He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Israel would reject him. He knows about the violence that's about to come upon him. He knows that they're going to beat him and mock him and spit on him and whip him and hang him on the cross. He faces all of that with courage. Why? He did all of that because he was committed to the will of his father. He completed that work on Calvary. He did it because he loved us. He did it because that was our only hope for salvation. He came into this world for that moment, and he does not try to get out of it. question this morning is this. When you're faced with moments of opposition, when you try to serve the Lord, do you have the same type of courage?
that it was also, in addition to being a night of, uh, of conspiracies and a night of courage, it was a night of compromise. You go back to Mark's account of, uh, of this night. At verse 50, the Bible tells us when Jesus was arrested, every one of those 11 disciples ran in fear. In fact, one young man, verses 51 and 52, who many believe to be Mark himself, runs away and he runs so fast that when one of the soldiers grabbed at him and grabbed his clothes, he left his clothes and kept running away naked. They thought that this moment would never come. They all believed in their hearts that they would stand with Jesus to the very end. They all really believed that they would die with him and for him and be ready to defend him. Now, 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 I know a lot of folk, when they, 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 they look at the story, they, they, they think Peter. And Peter was the one we find in Scripture at that moment who took out his sword and cut off one of the, the soldier's ears. But it was some other uh, announcements of bravery before this happened also. Go back to John chapter 14 when Jesus is telling them what's about to happen. Thomas stood up and said, well, let's go die with him. Thomas was ready to die. Peter, by attacking a soldier when there's 600 other soldiers around, was ready to die. But the moment that Jesus is arrested, every single one of them broke and ran. Bible says they forsook him. That word forsook means to abandon or to leave behind. These men literally fled and vanished into the night. They were convinced at one time that they would stand with Jesus. But when the hour of testing had come, each and every one of them left Jesus alone with his enemies. And before we get too hard on these guys, let's not boast about what we would do if we found ourselves in such a situation now, now I, I, I'm the type of person who, who believes, I, I, I believe I would, would, would be faithful. I would love to think I would stay faithful, but I, you don't know. And if you find somebody who will say they would definitely do something before they do it, you better watch out for that, folk, them people. Oh, I would never. You don't know what you would do if you're faced with a situation. I, I, I would like to think I'd stand there with Jesus. I'd like to think that I would fight for him, at least even be arrested with him or something. That's what these guys thought. But when the rubber met the road, each and every single one of them ran. Let me ask you the question, what would you have done? What would you do if you challenge or you are challenged for your faith? Think about this incident that really happened on April 20th, 1999. In the city of Littleton, Colorado, at Columbine High School, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebaugh went on a shooting rampage and murdered 12 folk. They approached a young lady, accounts tell us by the name of Cassie Bernhardt. Eric Harris found her hiding under a computer table. He kneels down, puts a shotgun in her mouth, and asks her, do you believe in God? She says yes. 
And at that very moment of her saying yes, he pulls the trigger and blows her head off. What would you have done in that situation? Is that not enough for you? Go back to the days of the old Soviet Union. When soldiers enter a meeting place where Christians are meeting in secret, worshiping the Lord. The soldiers run in and yell, if you're an unbeliever, leave now. If you're a believer, line up against the wall. A few faithful believers stand up and go line up on the wall, refusing to dishonor the Lord. And because of their stance, they are shot dead. What would you do? Go back further in history. In the days of the Roman Empire, under the Emperor Nero, there were a group of elite guard known as the Emperor's Wrestlers. These men had gained great success by wrestling in the Roman amphitheater and pledging their allegiance to Nero with these words, we the wrestlers, wrestling for you, O emperor, to win for you the victory for, from, and from you the victor's crown. When the Roman army fought in Gaul, which is now France, there were no soldiers braver or more loyal. But news one day reached Nero that many of these Roman soldiers who were called the emperor's wrestlers had accepted Jesus. A decree was dispatched to the Roman centurion, Vespasian, which said if there be any soldiers who cling to the Christian faith, they must die. The decree was received in the dead of winter as the soldiers were camped by a frozen lake. And with a sinking heart, Vespasian called the soldiers together and asked the question, do any of you cling to the Christian faith? If so, step forward. Instantly, 40 of the soldiers stepped forward, saluted, and stood at attention. And Vespasian paused. He had not expected so many of these select soldiers to answer in the affirmative. And trying to find a way out of his dilemma, he announced, I shall await your answer at sundown. Sundown came again. And he again asked the question. And again, the same 40 wrestlers stepped forward. And Vespasian pleaded with them to deny their faith without having any success. And finally, he said, the emperor's decree must be obeyed. But I am not willing that your comrades should shed our blood. And I am ordering you to march out on that lake of ice. And I shall leave you to the mercy of the elements. Those 40 soldiers were stripped naked and marched out to the center of that frozen lake. And as they marched, they broke into the chant of the arena. 40 wrestlers wrestling for you, O Christ, to win for you the victory and from you the victor's crown. And all night long, as Vespasian stood by his campfire, he listened to that chant over and over and over again as it grew fainter. As morning neared, one of these wrestlers, overcome by exposure, crept quietly toward the fire. And in the extremity of his suffering, he renounced his Lord. And as he did, that softly but clearly from the frozen lake came the chant, 39 wrestlers wrestling for you, O Christ, to win for you the victor and for us the victor's crown. 
And Vespasian, when he looked at that wrestler drawing closer to the fire and still looking out at those 39 who were still out on the ice, took off his helmet, took off his clothing and his armor, and ran out to the ice with the 39. And you know what he was shouting? 40 wrestlers wrestling for you, O Christ to win for you the victory and from you the crown. What would you have done? Would you have compromised? Or would you have stood your ground and stood for your faith in Jesus? Knowing what would come if you did. I'm going to give you a last thing that this night was. While it was a night of conspiracies and courage and compromise, it was also a night of compassion. Amidst all of the tragedies and trials that presented themselves that night, the stainless character of Jesus Christ shone brightly. Even when he was being betrayed by Judas, even while he was being forsaken by his disciples, even while he was being arrested by his enemies, Jesus was the perfect picture of love and grace. And I just want you to see the ways that his compassion was revealed in this incident. First of all, he demonstrates his compassion to a man by the name of Malchus. See, the Bible lets us know when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter reacts by attacking the servant of the high priest with his sword. John lets us know that that disciple was Peter. And when Peter cut off Malchus's ear, Jesus responded, watch this, by healing one of the ones who had come to do him harm. If that ain't love, if that ain't grace, I don't know what he is. See, because I, I, I'm one of them. I, I'm going to let you know right now, I'm not right all the time. And if you come at me and trying to attack me with a sword, guess what? It's you or me. But ain't but one of us going to be standing at the end. And if somebody takes you out, I probably will look at you and say, oh, well. Because it's you or me. Jesus took the one who came to do him harm and showed him love. How many of us could do that? Jesus took the one who came to harm him and showed him grace. How many of us could do that? And I've often thought about this incident. We are faced with situations all the time where we can show the same type of love and the same type of grace that Jesus showed here. The question is, do we, will we be like Jesus? Will we show that same kind of compassion even when we know that the folk who are standing in front of us mean us no good. But he also demonstrated compassion toward those soldiers. When these soldiers arrived at Gethsemane, John's account, I'm, I'm, let's go back there again, John chapter 18. When they showed up, Jesus showed, went out there to meet them. And I'm going to read it from beginning at verse number three again. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. 
Watch verse 6. As soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. There's a couple of things I need to, to show you. Those of you who've been, been paying attention in the Wednesday night Bible classes probably caught this a couple of weeks ago. But let me give it to you, all of you. When, they asked, when Jesus asked the question, who are you looking for? And they respond, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, uh, your King James Bible says, I am he. But if you look at that King James Bible carefully, you'll notice that word he is italicized. Now that simply means that that did not come from the original language, but it was put in there by the translators because they were trying to make it make sense for their readers. When you look at it in the original Greek language, when, when, when they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said, I am. Y'all know what that I am means, right? If you've paid attention to, 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 to our Bible, I am is an expression of his divinity, of his godness. And he shows his power as God by the, because the minute he said, I am, all of these 600 plus men are driven to the ground. Now, now if I got that kind of power, that just by speaking, I can make you fall to the ground, I've also got the same type of power that if I wanted to, I could have taken all of y'all's lives right then. Jesus didn't have to be arrested if Jesus didn't want to be arrested. Jesus didn't have to be tried if he didn't want to be tried. Jesus didn't want to have to be crucified if he didn't want to be crucified. Because he had the power at any moment to stop everything and take out the ones who were there to do him harm. So he shows them who he is in addition to telling them who he is. And I just believe that by him not taking them out when he could have was a sign of compassion. Because they were only there to fulfill God's will in the first place. They were only being used as a tool of God to bring about the means of our salvation. We would have no hope at eternal life. We would have no hope at salvation if Jesus didn't die. So he had to die. So that meant in this case he had to be arrested. But he also demonstrates his compassion to the one who betrayed him in the first place. Judas was a traitor. Judas sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That was the price of a slave. Judas led this 600 plus person mob to arrest Jesus. Judas comes to Jesus and actually betrays him with an act of love. And when Judas does this, Jesus does not react in anger. And matter of fact, according to Matthew's account, Matthew 26 and 50, Jesus says, friend, wherefore art thou coming? Jesus looked in the eyes of the man who was selling him out to his death and calls him a friend. How many of you would do that? Jesus knew what Judas was doing. Jesus knew long before Judas did it. And he still shows him compassion. He knew Judas was a lying, treacherous, traitorous hypocrite. But he didn't wait to this moment to show Jesus, uh, Judas compassion. He didn't wait to this moment to show uh, Judas love. 
he knew all along that Judas was the one who was going to betray him. But go back over to John chapter 13. You go back over to John 13. When all of this is being set up. Bear with me as I read. I'm going to start from verse number one. Now before the feast of the Passover. When Jesus knew that his hour would come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Watch this. He rises from supper and laid aside his towel, uh, garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. You probably remember, we've, we've, we've said this many times before, the job of washing feet was reserved for the lowest slave in the pecking order. It was such a disgusting duty that a Jewish slave in Jewish society could not be compelled to do it. It was given to a foreign slave. John lets us know that, that even at that time, it was revealed or it was known by Jesus that Judas would be the one to betray him. And he picks up a basin of water and a towel knowing that and washes that man's feet. Now, I love a whole lot of folk. You can't pay me to wash y'all's crusty, dirty, stanky feet. I'm not washing your feet. I'm not washing my kids' feet. I'm not even washing my wife's feet. And I believe y'all love me, and they love me, and I love y'all. Jesus knew that this man just hours later would sell him out. Would betray him to be crucified. Would sell him for the price of a slave. And he still picks up a towel and some water and washes his feet. Again, if that ain't love, if that ain't grace, I don't know what he is. Even the person who is about to send you to your death, you can show that type of love. He tries to reach Judas one more time. And this wasn't the first time he tried to reach Judas. All throughout his ministry, he tries to bring Judas clearly into the fold. Go over to Mark 14 and 18. When Jesus told his men that one of them would betray him, and he identifies him with the sop, he's trying to bring Jesus, or Judas away from his plan. John 13 and 26, he's trying to bring Judas uh, an opportunity to repent. Even you go all the way back to John chapter 6, when he said that, that uh, one of you is a devil, and he's referring to Judas. He's trying to, to alert Judas to the, to the, to the point that, that uh, uh, yeah, it's still time for you to turn this thing around. And the Lord does the same thing each and every day for you and me. 
every day that you live is proof of God's grace in your life. Every breath that you take is another moment where you can get it right with God. Every time you rub shoulders with somebody else, God is reaching out to you. And he does all of that because of love and grace, because he does not want you to be lost. He does it because he loves you. And I just beseech you, don't waste those opportunities. Come to him while you can. But there's one last final demonstration of compassion here, and, and, and I promise you we'll be done. He just demonstrates compassion toward Peter and the rest of the disciples and to the whole church itself. See, when Peter cut off the ear of that soldier, Peter was acting and reacting in the flesh. Peter had already boasted that he was ready to die with Jesus. And he proves his determination to at least fight right here. And had Jesus not intervened, Peter would probably have died that very moment. Because keep in mind, while he's cutting off the ear of that one soldier, there's 600 others armed to the teeth around them. You think they were going to let Peter get out of that? Peter, in the matter of seconds, would have been beaten to a bloody pulp if Jesus had not stepped in and shown his power. But not only that, do you realize how close the movement came to dying out even before it could get started. Because if the soldiers had attacked those disciples that night, the very men that Jesus had commissioned to take the gospel to the world would have died right there. There would have been no sermon from Peter on Pentecost. There would have been no book of Acts. There would have been no carrying of the gospel to Europe by Paul. The message would have never reached us in 2,000 years later. We would have never had the chance to be saved. But Jesus demonstrates compassion toward those he came for in this instance. And because they were, uh, 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 he showed compassion, they were spared. And because they were spared, we could receive salvation as well. Compassion was the hallmark of everything that night. Jesus loved us so much. He had so much compassion for us that he willingly suffered everything that he suffered. We sing the song and make the statement all the time, he could have called 10,000 angels. You better be glad he didn't. He didn't even need to call 10,000 angels. All he had to do was speak a word. Go back to his power again in the garden where he simply said, I am. And every one of those men fell to their behinds. He didn't have to, to, to say on the ground. He didn't have to wave his hand. He didn't have to say abracadabra. All he had to do was say, I'm God. Boom. And at any point he did that, he could have said, I am. The trial would have ended. I 
am, the beating would have stopped. I am, the Jewish leaders dead. I am, Pilate taken out. I am, no cross to carry. I am, come down from the cross. I am, you can't kill me. He didn't do none of that. Why? Paul says it so clearly in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He has so much compassion on you that he was willing to die for you. Nobody could kill him. Matter of fact, he told them, I freely give up my life. In other words, if I don't want to do this, ain't nothing you can do to make this happen. I willingly go to the cross. Why? Because I love them. I'm going to ask a question that I asked earlier in this sermon. Yeah, I want you to, to just consider it for a moment. What will you do with Jesus? Seeing that he loved you so much that he was willing to suffer all of that so that you could be saved. What will you do with Jesus? Ain't but two answers. There's no such thing as a middle ground with God. Either you accept or you reject. You accept him or you reject him. And the only person who can make that choice for you is you. Jesus ain't going to come and debo you into salvation. Jesus ain't going to come and say, get up against the wall. I'm here to save you. What will you do? What is your answer to that question? What will you do with Jesus? I beg you this morning to accept him by faith. Put your faith in him, faith that he is the only means by which you can be saved. Because it's not your good works that will save you. I don't care how good of a person you are. And you may truly be a good person. You may be a good, better person than all of the Christians you ever knew. That ain't enough to save you. Your salvation will only come by his grace. Have faith in that, that he came to save you by his grace. Let that faith lead you to repentance, to turning away from your sins. Let it lead you to confession that he is the Christ and that he is God's son. And let it lead you to baptism for the remission of all of your sins. That puts you in a right relationship with him. That washes your sins away. That establishes you and puts you into his church. And living faithful till you die, it will lead to a home in heaven. Maybe you are a child of God already, but for whatever reason, you haven't lived the life of a child of God as you should. And I'm going to let you in on a little bit of secret. Pay attention. Ain't nobody measured up. So when people start looking at, fun, at you funny because you ain't measured up, basically you're looking at a person who hasn't measured up themselves all the time. Paul lets us know in that same gospel of Romans that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us 
Only difference is, is their sin might look different than your sin. If you find yourself falling short, now is the time to come back to him. With a penitent spirit, he is faithful and just to forgive and restore no matter what the sins were or how many they are or how bad you or somebody else think they might be. You can come back to him and get yourself right today with him. And if you're in our digital worship space, we invite you to do that by just simply reaching out to us at the contact information on your screen. Whether it's the email address, whether it's the phone number, just reach out and we'll reach back out to you and facilitate whatever your need is. If you're here at the physical location, just come forward as we sing the song of everything. In fact, you don't even have to wait till we sing. You can come right now and get it right with God. And if that's your desire, we invite you to come right now as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation this morning. This is your time to come to God. Won't you come? Do 
For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shared for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink his poisonous fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Father, we come before you, thankful for thy son's sacrifice on the cross. Father, we take these emblems, gripped and trust sons, broken body and shed blood. May we be worthy of such a blessing. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Let us remember in the words of our Lord and Savior that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And in so giving, here at the Northside Congregation, we have several options in which you may give, such as bank pay, cash app, and PayPal. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the many blessings that we receive on a daily basis. Father, as we give back a portion of these many blessings, we hope that these gifts will be used, pleasing, and acceptable unto thee. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Let us adore the ever living God. Let us Yeah. 
service was acceptable in, in your sight. If it's not, please forgive us. Guide us all here as we depart ways. Lay your hands on the sick and the shut in. Heal us all mentally, physically, and spiritually. And guide us until we meet again. In Jesus Christ's name, let us pray. Let us say amen. <laughs> 